Hi, everybody. We have uh, Coach Gates and Sean East here. Uh, we're going to start with an opening statement by Coach before moving on to questions. Well, outstanding environment um, here at Pitt, uh, one of ba college basketball's uh, tradition. I truly believe um, that this place is a special place. Uh, I have so much respect for Coach Capel and what he's been able to do. Uh, that's a great basketball team he's put together. Uh, unbelievable team, great players, possibly the ACC player of the year. Um, you know, I challenged our guys to come out and play 40 minutes of basketball, and they answered uh, that expectation. Uh, it started in our post game uh, when we played against Loyola. We won the game, but our guys were still incomplete with that feeling. And sometimes you want to see that competitive edge. You want to see that spirit, that fight. And I thought our guys responded in a certain way. I shuffled the lineup. Uh, you know, me and Shawnee's had a conversation about the starting lineup, what the different things that we can do. Uh, and that's the expectations that my players, uh, you know, I have of my players to be able to give me suggestions. Uh, I truly believe the game was won with their, with their internal le leadership. I mean, I, I'm the head coach. I understand that. The staff does the scouts, and we all put – put our two cents in, but our players won that basketball game and I credit them, their focus, and obviously their connectivity in doing so. Um, and, and again, it was a hard fought game. <clears throat> that was an NCAA tournament format. Uh, I truly believe that neither team had more than two points in the first uh, 10 minutes. It was just nip tuck and we prevailed. We prevailed and that's a ball, great, great ball club. Any questions? Sean, you guys held Pitt's starting backcourt to 5 of 22 from the field. What were the keys to stopping them tonight? Uh, just to um, pressure them, you know, make them make decisions, you know, with pressure and uh, stay kind of solid on them, but, you know, discipline pressure. And uh, we kind of watched a few of them on them, and, you know, they kind of struggled a little bit with pressure. So we wanted to bring, you know, our pressure that we bring every day uh, to them and see how they would handle it. Coach Bridging off of that, Harrington 4-14 from the field. What was the key to stopping him? And do you feel like you executed the game plan you laid out for him? We executed some of it. I think when you hold a team to 10 field goals in the first half and then six field goals in the second half, free throws matter. But, you know, that, that becomes a little bit more stress on any ball club to see field goals not being able to be established. Um, they got to the foul line, yes. But, you know, Carrington, Henson, they're good players. They're great players, but we just wanted to play how we play and see what the results would be. We didn't come out with anything outside of what we do. We just wanted to do it in a consistent manner and give our very best and see what the outcome would be. And our guys were able to execute that and, and do exactly what I've asked and what the teammates talked about. And, and again, that was a tough game. That was an unbelievable game. And we had our backs against the wall. And I'm just proud of our guys for coming out. Uh, with a victory. Coach, how much do you think your size and athleticism altered shots during that game and forced Pitt into some bad shots? Well, I think number 75 finally got a 20-minute game. Uh, he hadn't played 20 minutes all year. Um, and basically, he didn't know if he was going to play today, just based off my decision. And ultimately, uh, that started in practice. We, we challenged him in the right way, and he responded without blinking. Uh, I talked to him, and I, we said, we need your very best. And he was able to do that. I thought he played a full game, top to bottom, meaning going from baseline to baseline. He was able to contest shots, but not only he, uh, we're one of the top teams in, in, in shot blocking in the country. So we're able to get Aiden Shaw, Noah Carter, and our guards in there to contest shots. By way of three-pointers, I thought they got us out of rhythm defensively with shot fakes and was able to drive and get some open looks. And toward the end, you know, Henson really brought them back with some tough shots that we knew he would be able to capitalize on. But our, our size is, 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 was great for us, but our positioning is more important. Well, then three, what about this game or this occasion led you to get that much out of Connor? What, what was the difference tonight that hasn't been there before? The difference was me as a coach. I told him I wasn't going to play him, and he accepted that. He wasn't afraid of the uh, accountability that I had for him. I said, if you're not going to give us what we need, then I'm not going to play you. And he said, okay, coach. And from there, literally, Connor Vanover did not practice the last two days. He didn't practice the day after our game. He didn't practice yesterday. He was on a scout team. So at that point, he got the message by being a starting center for the scout team. 
and I wasn't going to not hold them accountable. And what I appreciate the most is that young man allows himself to be held accountable. He didn't bark. He didn't fuss. He didn't bite. He didn't have a bad attitude. He came and gave his very best on the scout team. And we saw a reflection of that in the game. Do you feel like the, the 30, you know, 31 times the other team gets to the line, is that part of the price you pay when you're playing aggressive defense? Well, I can't script it, man. I, you know, I'm glad my guy, my guys, we prepare for it. I said at the beginning of the game, no one responds to a whistle except for me. And they did not respond to one whistle. Not one person on the bench, no one. I'm the only one that was able to talk to the refs. These guys didn't get distracted by it. They didn't get discouraged emotionally. They held their intelligence level up, and we wanted to be able to just play through it without blinking. That's our motto, don't blink. And the guys did not blink when those foul calls came against us. Now, it's catch-22. The game of basketball, when you have a team that scored 100 points twice, they don't see that ball goes in. They don't see it go in as much, but they can go in in the free throw. That takes the rhythm out of an offensive system. And I thought that gave us leverage to hold a good team like they are to 10 field goals in the first half, no matter how it came, right? And then six in the second half, I'll take that any day of the week, especially when we're on the other end, being able to execute and control the points in the paint. That was very important to us, controlling the points in the paint and the three-point line. There was a point where I think uh, you kind of had a back and forth that was like maybe like middle second half with one of the officials. What you, can you call what you, what you guys were, what you were, the point you were making at that time? We were just talking. I mean, these guys were were in the conference when I was at, uh, in the ACC under Leonard Hamilton. So they did a great job controlling the game. I'm not upset. I'm not mad. I think you probably saw, saw me over there smiling and laughing more than anything. And I, I truly believe my team absorbed some of that. I have to be able to hold myself accountable in that the same way I'm asking my players. And I didn't blink on it. I, I was cracking jokes as usual, making light of the situation and just said, hey, don't call a foul on me. That's all I wanted them to, to do, not, not to call a foul on me. I got out of the box one time when Con when um, Grill cut. Yeah, and, and but Grill cut, but the defender was legal, and we initiated that contact, and he told me that's who initiated. So sometimes when you look at the game, you know, it comes back and forth, but our guys did, did a good job. We're going to take a couple questions on the Zoom. Hey, yeah. Coach. Um you guys ended up with the rebounding edge tonight. You you talked about it being by committee. That four different players had at least five boards. What went into that game plan for y'all? It was a challenge and a focus. The challenge and a focus that was part of the game plan. We wanted our guys. They were plus 17 and a half in a rebounding margin over their last, um, you know, out of their first six, or seven games. And we wanted to put ourselves in a situation. We had no shot if we wasn't going to control the rebounds. We had no shot. So ultimately, think about the foul calls, right? That stops a team from having offensive rebounds, second chance points. The other part of it is it stops a team from getting a rhythm. Part of their offense was second chance points. Well, if they're on the free throw line, no one's going to try to take tough shots. They're going to make one shot or two shots, and then we're taking the ball out. I wanted our guys to be in position to win the game at the end. That's all I asked, and we were able to do that. And we had to do it on the rebounding uh, side. Yeah, Dennis, you started Aiden and Tamar. What did you feel like they brought to the starting lineup? Did you like what you got there? Well, it was Shawnee's idea. Shawnee's texted me in the middle of the night, and we texted you probably about 1 or 2 in the morning after games. And he just said, hey, what you think about this? And I took his advice. I looked at it, dissected it from an analytical standpoint. But he planted the seed, and I said, okay, let me look into that. And analytically – Defensively and offensively, it gave us what we needed uh, from the standpoint of coming on the road with some experienced experience guys. Bates played at Indiana. He knows on the road what to do in environments. Uh, Aiden Shaw in his second year, he took a big step uh, tonight. But also the guys that came off the bench, they were ready. It allowed me to hold guys accountable. And on our board and practice, that's the lineup I put in. I don't talk about it. I say this is what it is. And guys saw – First team, second team, scout team. And ultimately, guys were held accountable to their actions, and they responded. Another one of those guys that, that you like, Connor Vanover, that kind of got dropped from the starting lineup tonight was Caleb Grill. How, how did you 
feel about his response tonight, the way that he came into the game after being dropped from the, the starting lineup? Caleb Grill is a big time human being, great kid, uh, unbelievable. And, you know, he knew what we needed. He's one of our better, more efficient rebounders at the guard spot. And he was fighting for some, 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 some touches on that end. And what I appreciate the most is these guys allowed me to hold them accountable. They didn't come with a bad attitude when they looked at the board. They practiced. And who are you when adversity hits? Who are you when things don't go your way? And I think part of the journey of developing young men is to allow them to understand that they're accountable for certain things. And they have to allow coaches and different people to hold them that way. And from teammate to teammate, we had internal accountability. From coaches to coaches, we had internal accountability. And from coach to player and player to coaches. Uh, our sports psychologist, Dr. Joe Carr, he's done a great job uh, in our growth and development in that area. And we knew coming in, playing at Minnesota, we showed something, but we only played for 20 minutes in the second half. And we just wanted to play a complete game. And I thought that lineup and the substitution pattern allowed us to do that. Just a, a quick follow up for Sean. What what made you think of that starting lineup? When did you when did you text Coach Gates about that? Um, just you know, being around the game a lot and uh, just seeing how the team was going, we knew we needed a change. So at that point, we just had to think about it and you know, sit and talk with Coach Gates and just reading the energy in the room. It was just the right decision. You know what I'm saying? We had a, we needed a spark. Them two guys uh, bring consistent spark every day, and uh, you know. They hunt, they hunt what we call EGB. So it was just like we needed to come on the road, a, a, a type of disposition and a fight to us, and I knew they would bring that. So I just thought of that uh, to pair that with the three seniors that we got um, that's returning from last year. I knew it would be a good kind of kind of mix. Time for one Coach last question. Coach East has spoken. Coach East has spoken. One last question. Coach, uh, Butler left the game I, there. Just a little shoulder discomfort for him, or, or what's uh, what was what was going on with him there? He could have sold back in. Uh, he was fine. Uh, so we'll evaluate it. i got to talk to Chris Perrin, our trainer, and see what's going on, see if there's any, any further uh, exploration that's needed, whether it's x-rays or something. But he was fine. He was able to move his shoulder or arm with no problem. And it's one more. Um, it, it, some of these uh, challenge players. Mike, you get a question anytime. You've been knowing me since I first was a GA. Yeah, that's true. In Milwaukee. I appreciate you, man. Um, I, I, I I wanted to ask you, there are a lot of these challenge series that are going away, the Gavit games, the yeah. Big Ten. You guys are starting this up. Uh, yeah. What do you think of it? I mean, obviously, you're 1-0, so that's good. But what do you think of these kinds of games where you have to play, basically, in either your arena or the opponents? I think football has it right. They schedule the best games, no matter what. And they allow that schedule to take place over five years, ten years in advance. And you don't know who's going to be on a team. I wish college basketball allowed the same thing to happen uh, where you have inter not just ACC, SEC. I think everyone needs to continue to play everyone early as possible to try to keep the synergy in college basketball alive. It's a battle, uh, an entertainment battle. We know March Madness is March Madness for a reason. While always and at the same time keeping certain games against mid majors and low majors possible because those by games fuel their athletic department. So how can we balance it or even increase games? I think we have to see an increase in games possibly in college basketball go from 33 to possibly 40. Uh, I think that's something that we should look into. Uh, but you know, I think we're stuck in the past as it relates to by games, by games, by games, by games. I think every fan base want to see opponents like this face each other and not being afraid to go on the road. I credit Minnesota for allowing us to start a home and home, uh, starting at their place and then next year coming to ours. I thank Memphis for starting a home and home, starting at our place and then going on the road. That invigorates the fan base and that invigorates your team. You get to feel and see who your team is earlier. Uh, and I understand why. Scheduling is the way it is, but I think the model is out there that we may need to look into and see uh, because ultimately I think they have the right answer to have games in play. All right. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. M-I-Z. Go you.